Welcome uh, to an interview with Alan McSmith. My name is Kees Klomp. I'm a professor of applied science at the Rotterdam University of Applied Science. And my focus is on existential economics, uh, which is an ecology-based approach of uh, economics. Um, and that enables me to meet all sorts of fascinating, interesting people, <laughs> like wilderness guides from South Africa. Alan, welcome. Wilderness guide, indigenous wisdom keeper, uh, well, deliverer, whatever you want to call it, uh, ecologist. Um, welcome in Amsterdam. Uh, we're going to spend an hour with each other. Yep. Um, you're going to share uh, wonderful pictures. I already saw them. Stories. Uh, and we'll, we will reflect a bit later on natural leadership, uh, which is the core of your uh, thinking and uh, and doing and and we've decided that today it's all going to be positive uh, and love based aren't we yeah i think so guys thank you thank you and it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to yeah. to everybody uh, yeah i think so i think it's a good way to let's start strong and, and finish stronger um i think we all understand that you know what's going on on the planet yeah these days so let's just accept that it's happening uh, and um Maybe spend some time talking about other other yeah. things, um, but all in relation to that. So, I think it's a great idea. It's so all about positivity and moving forward. Yeah, yeah. So, what was the moment that you fell in love with Mother Earth? Um, gosh, I don't quite know how to answer that. I remember uh, my earliest memory. I was told by my mother was when I was 18 months old. It's just the the smell of of a campfire the smell of wood smoke. And, and in Africa, it's a very distinctive smell because the wood is very hard. It's not smoky and it has like a sweet uh, aroma. And, and uh, it stuck with me for a long time. And I think um, every campfire I've seen or been to or started since then, it's kind of like um, coming back home yeah. for me. Um, yeah. and, this is, and, and maybe this is a silly question, but nevertheless, I think it's an important one. So how, how does one become a wilderness guide? I mean, the, 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 there, is, there is no such thing as, I don't know, the wilderness guide university or you, what happened? <laughs> well, in, in those days when I started, um, I've, I've been guiding now for 35 years. And when I started, there was no such... Um, academy or course or um, any information at all. You know, if you if you had an uh, an average amount of knowledge and above average skill set with people, you were like super. You were uber qualified. Yeah. And it was pretty frightening. You know, there was a lot a lot of guys coming into the industry that um, were not. Um, yeah, maybe shouldn't have been doing it. But these days, I mean, there, there's some folks in the audience here that have um, gone through these courses, and it's all very different now. It's all very professional, but what I'd like to do and, and what I do when I'm connected to these organizations is, is bring back um, some of the old ways that you can't learn or read about mm. in books. It's about getting out there, putting your finger on the pulse, making yourself vulnerable and, um, and exploring that, that, that sensation, that inner journey that you have. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the difference between uh, knowledge, information and maybe knowing something. Yeah. I think it happens in that process. Can, can you still remember the moment where you yourself went from knowing into, let's say, being? Into, into being rather than, you know, n knowing ecology, but um, also really f feeling it? I think I'm still, uh, I'm still doing it. I think I'm still learning. Um, I don't profess to, to have, have any superpower or I don't profess to, to have attained anything. It's not like that at all. No. But I think... Um, yeah, I've, uh, having spent a lot of quality time and a lot of solitary time in nature, I think um, I know it works for me. Um, yeah. And um, this is essentially what I'd like to share, um, what, what I discovered and what I'm still discovering out there Yeah. Um, so with nature. So um, you're going to take us through uh, stories uh, yep. and, and beautiful pictures but before we do we we both need to introduce a very special guest yes, here please, on the table please go ahead uh because um ellen uh, ellen and i went uh, for a cup of coffee yesterday to uh, annette mill and jantelau uh, which was which, uh, absolutely amazing 
amazing experience to meet these yeah, guys. Yeah, so uh, Annette is uh, Holland's uh, yeah, most uh, elaborate uh, Ubuntu expert. And of course, both Jan Telau, everybody knows Jan Telau. Mm. And you, we had a cup of coffee uh, and there was an empty chair. <laughs> Uh, so we were all sitting in chairs, but there was one empty chair, and that was. And Jan told us uh, this was this was his new initiative, 90 years old, uh, the future chair. So every meeting he has, whether that is uh, private or uh, professionally, there is an empty chair uh, that is reserved for the future generations. And we decided then and then that we would like to pay homage to that initiative yes. by. Yes. inviting the future yes. generation to our table as well. Eh? Isn't that a wonderful thought? I, I, it's yeah. heartwarming. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. To to make that conscious and that this transition process that we are going through to, to acknowledge yeah. the people that are coming after us. So you're going to share your stories not only for the folks here, but also for the absolutely. future generations. Absolutely. Will you take us through it? Yes. Enjoy. Thank you. I'm going to sit over there. Am I on? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. um, well, thank you, Case, again, and um, thank you for the organizers, organizers of the event. And there's a few familiar faces. Um, there's some guys here that have spent time with me in the office, um, <laughs> if you like. And um, it's amazing to be here and uh, chat to you and share my story of stories with you. But I think, like, um, any good Zulu or Bushman storyteller, I think I, ha I think I have to acknowledge the fact that um, you know there's a legend to storytelling in Africa, and if you're going to tell a story, you have to go back to the beginning, and you have to tell the whole story. You can't leave anything out. Um, and Africa uh, owns time. It's the old continent. Uh, the Swiss or the Germans may have invented the clock or the watch, but we invented time. So it's one of the biggest challenges I've ever faced is to tell my story in a very short time. So I've got some time police uh, case if you would just... Um, the there's the time, okay. I'll just keep an eye on the time. And if I go, into, if I go over time, guys, please just stop me or, or maybe the referee will allocate us some extra time. <laughs> but um, yes, okay. So I've been guiding for, for 35 years. I live in South Africa and uh, Botswana, and um, I have no tertiary educational experience. I, I finished school and I started guiding, and that was uh, a while back. And my story is about what I discovered there, or what I'm st actually still discovering. So this is my natural habitat, if you like. Um, I've spent most of my life in remote places as deep into nature as possible. Uh, <laughs> preferably close to elephant herds. And that's um, another interesting part of the story that will come up later. But um, yeah, that's, this is where I've, uh, I've grown up and I've spent my time. And for me to travel to, to places like, like Holland uh, and Europe to, to share this, this story is, 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 is really a privilege. It really is an honor because sharing is uh, a very old thing. It's as old as us. It's old as a human animal. And um, what I'd like to suggest is that these old ancient um, feelings or intuitions or emotions, whatever you want to call them, are still very relevant for us today in modern society. And this is essentially what my story is about. Um, what we can learn from the past. And hopefully, we can break the cycle of not learning from the past. And um, there is a Zulu proverb um, and it goes, Isisasa loko, ukutkwepa, isisasa, lutkwepa, and yamazan. A loko, utkwepa, and yamazan, ukwepa, umuntu. Does anyone know what it means? <laughs> it, it means um, that what impacts the tree will impact the animal. And that what impacts the animal will also impact the man. And if that resonates with you, um, and perhaps it resonates now more than ever before, and, and, and only the truth resonates, isn't that so? Only things that are meaningful and important to you and threaten your fundamental 
sense of well-being and stillness. Those are the things that resonate. Um, and yeah, I think it's fair to say that we need to address how we've been living on the planet and how we have been impacting uh, the natural laws of ecology and what we can learn from the past. But what I'd like to do is, what I'd like to suggest is, we assume that, that's all in the bag. I mean, we all know, I think um, any intelligent person on the, on the planet right now would, would say, yeah, this is the case. We're out of balance. Mama nature is not too impressed with us. So let's move forward. Let's move forward. But uh, this may sound counterintuitive to you, but perhaps moving forward is not where you may think it is. It may be 180 degrees in the other way. Um, so this, my, story, my story of stories is maybe a little different. Um, it may challenge some, some of your, um, yeah, your belief systems or your, your understandings of what's going on. And uh, that's what I'm here to do, to, to challenge you and perhaps confuse you. So be my mission this afternoon. Okay, so this is um, my office. Uh, one of my offices is the Okavango Delta in, in Botswana. And the Okavango is a massive wetland paradise. It's an oasis in the Kalahari. And it floods once a year. And it transforms the desert into this incredible myriad of life. Okay. In Zulu, the word water is amanzi, which means that what produces things, that what nourishes things, and that what changes things. And that's what this area does. And this represents the landscape of our soul. This is an old place. Africa is an old place. Um, and moving through the Okavango, there, are, there is a lot of game. There's a lot of elephants. And um, I have to tell you a story. Uh, when I was uh, walking with some students, um, we came across an elephant herd, a small elephant herd that were walking towards us. And I decided to sit in the ground, sit in, sit in the grass on top of this little termite mound and wait for the herd to come towards us. And eventually they approached us very close to within maybe uh, five or six meters or so. And this cow with a very young baby stood in front of us. The, her ears were outstretched. And she stared me down and I heard this voice. It may sound a bit wacky, but I heard this kind of a voice in the background and I thought, that's odd. There's no camp here. There's no vehicle coming past. What, what, what is going on? And it took a while for the, oops, the, light, the light to come on and then I, I interpreted the voice. And what I heard was, tell them who we really are. And I was left with no, no doubt that the elephants were saying, listen, please go out there and just tell people who we really are. And yeah, it took me a while to, um, to get over that because it was incredibly emotional. And um, you know, for me, elephant conservation after that became a very, very, very crucial thing in my life. Um, and, and it's because of this, this connection with an animal that defies all logic, it defies intelligence. They are super complex. And of course, they are cursed with the white gold. Um, but elephant conservation is almost as relative and almost as pertinent as wildlife conservation on the African continent. And for me, it's easy, it's easy to fall in love with an elephant. And once you do that, it's easy to fall in love with the birds and the bees and the trees and the snakes and the spiders. And once you do that, you fall in love with everything. And once you fall in love with everything, you take the destruction of that personally. So if I see a picture of a dead, a dead, a dead elephant or a, a trinket of an ivory carved uh, ornament on some distant mantelpiece, it goes, <gasps> It hurts, yeah. and um, that's what um, conservation is all about for me. So um, I'm going to try and do something uh, maybe a little different. Now that I've introduced myself and my office, what I'd like to do is introduce you to yourselves. Mm. Um, so we do things differently in Africa. OK, so I have a question for you. It's a very simple question. and. Um, in your mind, let's say five, make a mental list of five important people.
Have you got your list? Remember, we are in time. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you who's on your list, but um, just a show of hands. Um, did anyone have yourself on the list? One, two, two. Yeah, well, um, I was never very good at maths at school, but I know that two out of 60 is not a very high percentage. <laughs> <laughs> I, even I can tell you that. And I think, I, I think Greta Thunberg spent more time in school than, than I did. But anyway, um, yeah, why not? How come you're not on the list? And, and how, it's not only on the list, but how come you're not number one on the list? Uh, this is the interesting paradigm that I think cuts to the chase of what natural leadership is about. You know, perhaps, perhaps modern society or um, you know, our peers or our, uh, our systems that we work in will suggest that if you want to attain something, if you want to achieve something, you go and get it. It's out there. You go and, you go and reach it and you conquer the obstacles in the process. That is possibly a form of leadership. But for me, natural leadership is the other way. It's, in, it's internal. It's some empty time with yourself. Um, yeah, coming home to yourself. And um, over the, the, the last few days in Holland with, um, under the expert um, urban jungle guidance of case, um, the, the, these are, there's, there's some common denominators that came up speaking to folks, and one of them was this, this, this capacity or this concept of coming home, finding stillness in yourself, healing. And perhaps it's, as, it's really as simple as that. It's healing. It's healing this rift that we have with nature um, by coming closer to ourselves first. And the story kind of addresses that. But yeah, for, for me, coming back to yourself, making yourself number one on the list, uh, no one else is going to be inspired. Um, so it, inspiration comes from within. Um, and if you can tap into su sustainable resilience um, and meaningful transitions when you have to go through times of uncertainty, that inspiration is with you all the time. It's inside. So leadership for me is first in and then out. Um, it's um, a little bit of space, if you like, between yesterday and tomorrow. So I think we live, um, majority of the time, we live either in the past. We are trying to understand the information that we have accumulated from, from university, from work, from the world, from the collective consciousness, from the media. And then we try and convert that information into the future to try and make sense of it. And we end up worrying about tomorrow or the next hour or the next five minutes. So we're kind of oscillating between the past and the future. I call it a kind of ecological autism. Um, and with the pace of the world, with the social media, uh, and the, the stimuli that's they're constantly sparking us, we are kind of like interfacing all the time. And what nature does, and what sinking down with yourself does, is it creates a little bit of space. Just, just a bit of space between the past and the future. And in that moment, the present moment, original thought and inspiring thought and innovative thought emerges. And that is what nature does. So for me, in any, um, any form or format of, of uh, turbulence, social turbulence, conflict for territory, conflict for resources, all comes from this, this split that we have internally. Um, two sides of the same coin. So yes, please guys, put yourself on the list. Um, and to carry on with the virtual safari, if you like, the virtual trail, uh, in the Okavango we end up walking a lot. Um, as often and as regularly and as, as close to lions and, and leopards and elephants as possible. Um, John and Betrace, yeah, you guys were out in the Okavango, and it is a remarkable place. And it may be counterintuitive to, to um, think, well, we're going to get out on foot, we're going to walk after these lions, and we're going to try and find them. 
I mean, who would actually do <laughs> who would actually do that? These are big animals. They're 200 kilograms. Um, who would think of trying to find a gang of serial killers out on foot? Why? It doesn't make sense, does it? Right? It makes the most perfect sense in the world because you are going back. You're resetting. You, the circular flow of inspiration is back towards where it came from, and it came from the past because we all connected, and we all connected to Africa. <coughs> and... Um, Finding a way through the modern world. Um, and, I, and I'd like to bring up um, the Bushmen and the, the Stone Age, the, the, the living Stone Age culture of the Bushmen. But just to, this, this is a skimmer, by the way. It's an African skimmer. It's an unbelievable bird. And, and the lower bill, his lower mandible is longer than the top. So when he's flying over the water like that, he's drinking. So the bill will come down to about here. So he flies over and he sucks up water like this and catches insects. It's beautiful. And you might meet a few unwanted visitors along the way. And I think that's right. I think that's how, that's how nature is. Why, why, should, why should there be no crocodiles in the water? Why should the future be certain? Why should there be no change? Because what nature suggests and what the laws of nature suggest is that change is constant. The only thing that we can be sure of are death, taxes, and change. And I spoke to an accountant last week, and he said, well, maybe I can help you with your taxes. Uh, not even sure if taxes is, is, is certain. But anyway, that's, that's for another story, I guess. So um, a while back, I was um, working for a safari company in the Okavango, um, which um, the, they had two camps. And the one camp, um, they were about 50 kilometers away from each other, separated by a river. And we used to do boat trips between the camps uh, as part of the, yeah, as part of the safari experience. And no one had done it by canoe before. So I guess for a young 21, 22 year old guy, that was like a perfect reason to do it. <laughs> no one had done it before. So I hopped in the canoe and, and by boat it took about three or four hours. Uh, I thought it would take maybe seven or eight hours, but it took me three days because I came across uncertainty and I came across challenges. Um, I had to transform my understanding of what was going on. And we came to a point where we knew where a big crocodile was, and, and when I say big, I mean, um, yeah, not small. Um, and when he saw me, um, I was paddling the canoe. I wasn't poling. It wasn't a makoro. It was a, a proper Indian canoe. And when he, when he turned around and saw me, he dropped bloop, into the water and he started swimming towards me. It was like a torpedo, like a missile through the water. It came straight towards me. So I thought, well, the only thing I could do is actually get some momentum and paddle towards him. Because that's the way forward, right? I couldn't go backwards. I couldn't go sideways. So I just said, well, I'm going to go forward. And he came up underneath the, the canoe. He lifted it up and... And uh, I dropped down, and as I dropped down, he popped up behind me here. And I nearly fell off on top of him. <laughs> I think if that happened, uh, we wouldn't be having this, this chat <laughs> this afternoon. And we were, <laughs> yeah. I think it's safe to say. But uh, what he did was he, he tapped on the canoe, and he realized, oh, hang on, it's made of fiberglass. This is not edible. He didn't know that the highly agitated guide sitting in the back was, certainly was. <laughs> So the highly agitated guy had said, I'm getting off the water. And I, I headed straight towards a, a bank. I managed to get off. Um, and for me, um, crocodiles are, um, I think they're rather interesting. They've been around for, for millions and millions of years, longer than we have. Um, and you know, I just fuzz your focus a little bit about, you know, around that. Just imagine that this animal, this big, big reptile, is is a remnant of the dinosaur age, if you like, and it has evolved long before we were ever a drop in the ocean. So all the, the sum total of our fears, of our anxieties, of our insecurities, um, the dark side of what we perceive life to be, uh, we put into an animal like a crocodile because we fear it. We don't understand it. It's the murky predator of the depths. 
you know, if you're in water, you're out of your, your, your comfort zone, you're out of your habitat, and there's a crocodile in the water, it's, it's kind of like a, it ticks all the buttons of what we don't know. It's like everything we don't know parked in an animal. Yeah. And if you take a crocodile to God's workshop and you put it on the work table and you say, would you be able to improve this design? Could you fix anything here? And he said, absolutely not. This is the perfect, perfect design. But you, however, I could maybe do a little work with <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway. So with that in mind, um, that, that's... That's what I went through. For me, this process of, of paddling, flowing, getting, flowing through the river and, 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 and moving with that, that flow of life. I, had, I encountered this crocodile, which for me was the sum total of everything I didn't want to be or everything I couldn't understand. I got off the water, and as I did that, this herd of elephant um, came around, and they started feeding around me the whole night, which is unusual. They don't stay in one place for that long, but for the whole night, they stayed between me and the water. And again, I was left with no explanation or no, um, uh, yeah, that's, the elephants kept me company for the whole night. Um, so, and I had to, in order to experience that life-changing moment with elephants and the inspiration that they helped me to, um, to discover, I had to meet the crocodile on the flow of life. So I've got infinite respect for crocodiles. Um, and every time I see one, I say, thank you, Mr. Crocodile, for introducing me to, to elephants. Because I learned something about elephants. And in that process, I discovered this fountain uh, of inspiration that came from myself. That, that sacred space that I was in with the elephants um, gave me an, an appointment with life, if you like. So, so yeah, the, the, <laughs> these are wild dogs. You know it's coming. <laughs> these are wild dogs. They are one of the, yeah, one of the most endangered predators on the planet. I think it's fair to say. Um, the Okavango at home is uh, one of the, yeah, one of the gold star areas. One of the prime wild dog population zones in the world, and uh, the, the most remarkable animals. And for, we were on safari, I can't remember how, when it was, with John and um, Betrays. And we were at a camp called Bushman Plains. And we were on a game drive, and um, we came across this little, little uh, cluster of wild dog pups. And for me, that, that was like, it was five or six of them. And if those pups didn't survive, it's quite possible that the population of dogs in that area were in serious trouble. Yeah. So we found them, and they were, they were in this little grassy area. And what dogs do when the adults go hunting, they leave the little ones behind. So if they're too small to actually participate in the, in the hunt, they stay back, guys. You can join us later. And the older they get, the more they participate and more they get closer and closer to the action. That's how they learn. These were little guys, so they were left behind. And we found them in the mid-afternoon. And... Um, I said to the guys, to John and Betres, we can't leave them here. We have to sit with them. And there was a hyena lurking around. You could see him in the distance. So we parked the Land Cruiser right next to them, and we sat with them until the adults arrived. It's a couple of hours. Um, and we sat with them. And eventually their, their ears pricked up, and you, we heard the dogs in the distance calling. And the pups got up and, and moved off, so, and, the, and the pack was reunited. And it felt good. We went back to the camp. We sat at the fire, and you know, we felt like we'd, we'd nurtured something, some magical little egg in the wild dog population. And if you're in the Okavango or if you're, you're, you're in Africa, rare animals are like that. They represent the edge of survival. Um, and it's like looking into a smoky mirror sometimes. And that night I was fast asleep, quite innocently in my tent. And uh, I woke up to this like, kind of like an explosion. Like <laughs> and I sat bolt upright, had no idea what it was. So I went outside with my torch and 
there in front of the tent, the dogs, the pack, and the little ones were there as well. They'd killed an impala right in front of the tent. So, of course, I ran off to, to John and Batrace and the other clients' tents. I said, come, look at this, come, come. So we're all wandering around at night with our torches looking at these wild dogs. And I honestly felt there was some... There was something coming back to us, you know, because of what we did. And this is quite unusual. Um, and it was, it was only in the morning that I figured out what the noise was because the side of the tent was kind of like caved in. So what the dogs had done, would they chased the impala into the tent, into the side of the tent, and killed it right next to my head. <laughs> it sounds... It sounds gory and it sounds um, ghastly and it sounds bloody and all that, but the law of the bush will say that we'll tolerate killing. If you do it for the right reasons, there's a dignity in that. Um, but, yeah, we've stepped outside that, I think, but that's, we weren't going to go there. Um, so, yeah, we felt really vindicated about doing our bit for conservation and specifically for the dogs. And... Um, yeah, then, then the, yeah, moments kind of come to you. And, uh, and again, the connection for me um, with, and I mean, look, at, look into those eyes. And isn't there a connection there? Um, there's something going on there. And for me, a connection is, uh, it happens in both directions. I, I, I can't really have a connection with this table here because it's, it's only coming from me to the table. But I can have a connection with the leopard or the elephant because it's coming from both ways. It takes both directions to have a connection, or else it's just half a connection and it's not a connection. Um, so something happens to you out there. There's something that awakens. And I think there's an easy explanation for that. Um, and this is a very important part of the story. This is a old, very old Swiss army knife. It's about 500,000 years old. So this is a hand axe. You can see how big it is. It's pretty about this big. It was picked up uh, in the, the Mahari Khari Pan area in Botswana. And this is a sign of very, very old human habitation. 500,000 years ago. That's the early Stone Age. Um, and the remnants or the descendants of those people or those days are the sand bushmen. Uh, and, and these guys are living Stone Age people. It's the oldest uh, and the most su uh, successful culture of people ever known on the planet. They've been living like this for 50,000 years. It's a lot longer than us. Um, it's a very sophisticated society. Um, the language, the culture... Um, the storytelling, the information, the legends, the folklore, the superstitions is very, very sophisticated. It's such a sophisticated culture that there's no word for the, con for the concept of conservation or sustainability or regeneration or preservation. It just doesn't exist because it's entirely normal. Um, so this is an ostrich egg. This old man is um, playing with an ostrich egg. And it's about the size, I guess, of maybe two dozen chicken eggs. So it can make a nice big omelet. And you feed the whole village for breakfast. And ostrich egg for, for, for the Bushman culture is a very valuable, very important thing. Because not only is it a form, it's a meal, you know, once-off meal, but it's also a container, a reservoir for survival. So once the egg has been used, um, water can be stored in the egg. They plug it up with a bit of grass, and they bury it and use it as a, you know, emergency rations in times of drought. And they will also grind or break pieces of egg up and make trinkets, uh, bangles, necklaces from the eggshells. And that is a very important um, part of, of the social fabric because it's a gift, it's a declaration of love to your your wife or your husband or your child. Um, it's, a, it's a form of respect. It's not jewelry. It's not a commodity. It's, it's given away. 
So when you find an ostrich egg, it's like, woohoo, I've just won the lottery, basically, in Bushman society. And I was walking with a colleague once, and we found one um, just lying in the middle of the grass. And this guy bent over and picked it up, and he was like, wow, look at this. And he was, ex he was, he was explaining through the interpreter what it meant for him. And as he was studying the egg, he turned it over, and he saw a bite mark, a scratch mark on the side of the egg, the other side. And he looked at this, and he looked at us, and he looked at the egg again, and he said, this is the mark, the bite mark of a hyena. This is not my egg. This is not our egg. It's the hyena's egg. So he put it back on the ground. He said, let's go and find another one. Um, yeah, and, and some things come to you when you experience that. I think um, it's... Maybe it's a bit romantic to say that his survival depended on that egg and he put himself at risk to respect the hyena. It, it could very, very, very well be possible because the, the Kalahari is a very dry, inhospitable place. Um, but I tell you what, is it any more dry, inhospitable and dangerous than anywhere else in the world? I don't know with all the comforts and conveniences that we have, do we translate that into to happiness or even health? Like, so, yeah, going back, going back and spending time with these guys, um, some things come to you, and, and perhaps that's it. Maybe that's kind of like a, a sustainability in the a turbocharged version of, of sustainability, if you like that my very survival is dependent on this egg, yet I'm not going to have it, because I shouldn't have it. Some things are not meant for me. The hyena is my relative. Um, so, yeah, amazing guys. Um, so we, we go out and make fire with them. Um, yeah, and some things come to you. Some things really, really come to you, like this... Uh, the fact that they've been living a Stone Age existence for 50,000 years in complete harmony with nature, in complete union with, with, with what the planet provides for them. Um, and there's a, a colleague of mine, um, he's, he's made an appearance before on the talks. His name is Cobra. Uh, he works for a, a company called Natural Selections at Jack's Camp in the Mahari Khari Pans area. And this guy is quite amazing. He, for, for a start, he doesn't know how old he is. No one knows how old he is. Um, I saw his ID card once, uh, and it said the date. I can't remember what it was. So I looked at him, and I said, oh, you are how, how, how many years, whatever it was. And he said, no, I'm not that old. I don't know how old I am. The government told me I was this old because I had to go and get an ID card. I told the government I did not know where I was born. I said, okay, fine. That's when you were born. That's how old you are. There's your ID. I'm not interested in an ID because I don't want to know how much time I don't have. <laughs> uh, and uh, Cobra is illiterate. Um, and, and, and perhaps in the context of modern society, if, if, we, if we translate um, intelligence as academic ability, if that's the definition of what intelligence, intelligence is, then he's got no hope, has he? In reality. But there's a difference between truth and reality because in his habitat, in his sacred space, which is his castle, this man is unbelievable. I've never met anyone so uh, comfortable and competent in his own cobra-ness, if you like. Um, and he, um, he, he, we were walking with Cobra once, and he found this. Uh, he was he was digging up a little plant, and he found I don't know what a tuber or a piece of root. I don't know what would you call that in Dutch, like an underground root of the plant. That's the one, the wortel. That's the one. He dug it up, and um, he showed us how to cut some of the the tissue off with his penknife. He had a penknife, not a, a <laughs> not a stone. Um, and he, he, he mulched it up in his hand and it ran down his thumb like this and we, we all had a, a drink of it. And there were some of us that were quite thirsty. It was a hot day in the Kalahari and we wanted more. And Cobra said, no, you can't take more because 
if you take too much, then the plant will die. It cannot recover itself because it needs so much of its wortel to, to survive the Kalahari. So we're putting it back. Um, some other Zulu, uh, Zulu, some other Bushman traveler or some other animal or some um, an impala or perhaps a kudu will need this. So we're putting it back. And not only did he put it back, but he collected all the, the pieces of uh, fiber that we'd used and he got whatever water there was and he gave the last drop of water to the plant. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, quite, that's quite something. And, and you, look at, you look at Cobra and you, you really get a feeling that, I mean, he's one, of the last, he's one of the last remaining people of a very isolated and a very remote um, clan of Bushmen. And it's almost like he's holding a, a delicate crystal goblet you know, it's filled with, with 50,000 years of wisdom. And this, this goblet can break at any point, and the wisdom will leak out into the sand, into the desert, and be gone forever. Um, and my story is, is, a, is about that. It's a declaration that we can't let this happen. We have to keep the stories of Cobra alive, and the crocodiles, and the elephants. Um, because those are the fabrics that we co-evolved with and alongside. So I think the, the understanding is that Africa is the motherland. I think a lot of um, paleontologists will suggest that it's more than likely that the human animal evolved from Africa at some point. It's probably not as simplistic as that, and it's, it's not my um, intention to, to compromise your your belief systems, your religious or your spiritual belief systems, but it's highly possible that we are all African. So when you come on safari to Africa, you're not coming on a safari to Africa, you're coming home. And that is a microcosm of the split that we have, that we have in this world. We need to come home to ourselves first. So nature is not a place. It's, it's in us. We're in it, and it's in us all the time, and we are it. And spending time with the, with the Bushmen and Cobra, um, there's a very real qualification of that. And I'd like to invite you to spend some time sitting on the ground in the Kalahari. Um, what the Bushmen culture uh, does, the traditional uh, Bushmen belief, is that once you are of age, or once you're going through a transition, or maybe there's a bit of a bumpy road up ahead, or maybe some change or uncertainty. Does it sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> are we any different to, to the Bushmen? So what the Bushmen elders, elders would do is they'd uh, invite you to spend a night going through this rite of passage um, in order to in order to navigate through the changes as resiliently and as sustainably as possible. So I'd like to invite you to join um, a Bushman on the ground in the Kalahari. So take a seat in the Kalahari and close your eyes <coughs> and imagine yourself sitting there. And the deal is that uh, in order to, to go through this rite, you need to sit there the whole night. And you can't move until the sun, you feel the sun on your face the, the next morning. And one of the old bushmen, someone probably like Cobra, would walk you out there, park you down on the ground, and put a blindfold on you and leave you there. And you have to sit. So imagine yourself doing this. It's dark. Uh, the wind stops. Um, so you're sitting on the ground and even the frogs go quiet. And you know when the frogs stop calling that something is moving around. But yeah, you're relying on the traditions and the rite of passage to find your way back to yourself. And once you do that, you realize you can, you can do anything. So you're sitting in the darkness and um, from behind, the monkeys start calling. A 
And soon after that, the baboons. <coughs> and then, just after that, you realize why these animals are a little bit nervous, because a leopard walks past in front of you. <coughs> And it's about then that you can feel the blood pumping through your veins. Um, but you trust the old ways, um, and you trust the wisdom of the old ways and the attachment that you're on. You're sitting on the ground, and this is you're rooted yourself. Um, the branches of your life are blowing wildly in the storms, but you're sitting on the ground, and the root of the tree or the main bark of the tree is rooted strongly. Um, and slowly, mercifully, Eventually, <laughs> the sun starts rising. And you can feel the, the, the change in light. You can feel the warmth as the sun shines on your legs and it lifts up onto your belly, onto your chest. And eventually, you feel the sunlight on your face. And you, wow, you rip the blindfold off. And you've sat through the night. And you're still alive. The monkeys haven't got you. The baboons haven't got you. Um, the leopard hasn't got you, the crocodiles haven't got you, the elephants haven't got you. The sum total of all your fears have been absent. And, yeah, it's quite a, a surreal experience. And you're kind of looking around and, and you turn around and look. And the first thing you see as you look behind you is the old man was sitting behind you the whole night in complete silence, just sitting there just having a compassionate time in his sacred space with you to invite you to yours. And, yeah, so said, okay, fine, the sun's up, let's go back, let's go back to work. Um, and I, I think um, that young bushman or young bushwoman that was going through that, that transition time, I think walked away with, with a, a sense of stillness. Um, and and for, for me, this, this, this little story for me kind of, captures or encapsulates what natural leadership is all about, the difference between natural leadership and organizational leadership, if you'd like to call it that, where everything is, most things are logical based. You know, if you think about it, it's got to happen. You've got to put it in a box or put it into some format for it to make sense. Natural leadership makes no sense at all. It really doesn't. But the most fundamental thing that I believe motivates or drives a human animal is, is a desire to find stillness. The word stillness can be translated into diff many different other concepts, but basically it's stillness. And that's what um, this young bushman or young bushwoman discovered. And what the old man discovered a long time ago was that the next fundamental desire, the next fundamental engine that motivates us is the desire to share it. Because we want to share what makes us feel still. We want to conserve it. We want to preserve it. We want to even risk our lives to save it. And that's called, I guess that's called conservation or coming back to, to pay homage to the natural person that's within all of us. There's a natural bushman or a bushwoman inside all of us. Um, so spending time out there is not about a connection. It's not about a connection at all because the connection has already been, it's already there. It's been there for, for thousands and hundreds and thousands of years. It's, it's about a reconnection. It's about coming home. Back to the present moment um, and an appointment with life. Yeah, so um, the serial killers were kept at bay by natural leadership. Um, and yeah, it's it's a very difficult. You know, it's like it's a lot of English words often don't have um, the right meaning for something. You know, like uh, what does compassion mean, or what does tolerance mean, or what does leadership mean? Um, there's there's no real. The word just doesn't. Maybe in Dutch it does a, a better job, but but in English for me it's like uh, it means more than that. It means everything, but nothing. Yeah, so 
yeah, maybe that's what natural leadership is, is, is unpacking these ancient desires that, that are as, not desires, feelings, emotions, instincts that, is, that are as old as the human animal itself and actually making them contemporary again because that's when you become creative. Is first going back to go forward. So um, in conclusion, guys, um, just uh, how are we doing for time, guys? Nine minutes. I think we've got extra time. Yeah. Okay. I think um, for me, one of the words, for example, is compassion. Eh? Um, what does compassion mean to you? Anyone got a definition of compassion? Forgiveness? Yeah. It's more like understanding the other one. Trying to understand. Yeah. Good one. Anything else? Caring for someone else? Caring, yeah. Another one? You guys? Love. 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 That's another fuzzy word, isn't it? So there's two put put two fuzzy words together, you've got a nice fuzzy concept, but yeah, these these are for me. These are all compassion. Um, I, I guess for me, the the um, what I've learned from the Bushman, and I guess what what natural leadership will suggest is compassion is about sharing. Eh? Um, there was a a, a leg bone of a femur that was discovered in Botswana from an early. It was a late Stone Age uh, leg bone. It was about fifteen thousand years old, I think. Um, very well preserved. So it was an early ancestor of a Bushman. And um, it had a fracture in it, it a healed fracture. Now, um, if I haven't, I've been fortunate enough not to break a femur yet, but I would imagine that it's not good. <laughs> it could even be life-threatening. And if you are moving around as a hunter-gatherer, a hunter-gatherer and tracker in the Kalahari, the only way you'd survive an injury like that is if you were looked after. If other people shared compassion, shared their time, their, their energy, their resourcefulness, even putting themselves in the movement of, of their community at risk by staying put with you or, or carrying you somehow. And um, again, using the incredible amount of uh, traditional medicine, traditional healing, which is like crazy. These guys are brilliant pharmacists. But for me, that was maybe that's an indication of how, of how far back passion go, um, passion, compassion goes and sharing. It's as old as the human animal itself. Um, so yeah, for me, that's it's about giving and, and maybe maybe listening to people as well is, is a form of compassion. Um, and in Bushman society, the, the guys are very good listeners. Um, the fabric of, of, of the society and the fabric of um, the togetherness is based on compassionate listening or um, the ecology of community where you can discover something about yourself. You can empower and grow within yourself by discovering about the differences you have with other people. Um, that's sharing something of yourself, making you vulnerable, making yourself vulnerable in that situation. Um, yeah, so for me, um, these these um, old feelings or emotions, like compassion, um, they're not new, and I'm here to share. And and for me, sharing is is an important part of of, if you like, paying homage to my origins because. The stories might be original, but the messages are not. I have no ownership of these messages. I've got no ownership of the concepts of what natural leadership is. Because if you, if you put them in the cage or if you um, turn them into a commodity, if you buy or sell them or modify them, then they cease to be. It's like a bird in a cage. Is it really a bird? It might look like a bird, but it's, it's not a bird, is it? 
by definition of what a bird is. Um, so sharing these things is very important, and uh, especially in times like these. And I would like to um, wish you well on your uh, virtual trail through the changes, through the, the storms uh, as you move ahead and tackle the changes. And um, I guess for me, the, the, um, the, to sum up what natural leadership is for me in context of organizational leadership and in context of trying to arrange change and transform systems in the way that we, I think we all need to happen now. Um, I'd like to leave you with a, with a question or a riddle um, to confuse you even more, it is hoped. Okay, so if, let's, let's put it this way, if, if, I, if I give you a euro and you give me a euro, we each have one euro. But if I give you an idea and you give me an idea, we each have two ideas. <laughs> so, so bearing that in mind, this, this is not a room full of people listening to some, some guy from Botswana making elephant sounds, uh, making baboon sounds and, and animal sounds. It's a room full of infinite possibility and original inspiration. If you tap into the old ways and go back, and make an appointment with life in the sacred spaces that are still around us. And they are around us in Holland, in Europe. They are around us all the time. If you pay attention and make yourself available to them, the sounds of birds, the smell of water, the smell of the air. Next time it rains, don't use an umbrella. Just feel the, the water on your skin. Um, listen to your friend. You know, sit and listen to the person who's talking to you. You'll be surprised how that empowers you just by sharing yourself. So those are the things that um, for me are the kind of like golden threads or the, the facets of what natural leadership is, is about. So again, thank you very much. And Case, yeah, where, you where to next? Well, you yeah, sit down, please. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so we have a couple more minutes, oh, a few questions, or a couple of reflections first, because I was um, touched by a, a few of your remarks during your um, talk. Um, first of all, conserv conservation has to be personal. Yeah. I find that that is wonderful. You have to get all in. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. I think, uh, I think you have to almost in a sense take personal accountability for for what's happening around us in yeah. all in all ways you even though you're not directly responsible for it you are certainly part of the solution and the only way to be part of the solution is to to make yourself vulnerable with yeah. the problem yeah you just said hey, you need to be available <laughs> make yourself yeah. available yeah, yeah 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 and is it how difficult is it to witness um degeneration and then be all in <laughs> uh, emotionally involved as well with um, conservation I can I can imagine it's it's quite tough to find balance in that yeah yeah that's that is the the essentially the bottom line isn't yeah. it that's like say, how you do, I mean it sounds great it sounds wonderful and it's it's meaningful but actually how do you put it into practice this is the essential challenge and um, um, you, were, you were chatting to me about uh, your experiences with Buddhism the other day, and for me, perhaps it's the same thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm expecting like this magic light bulb to to come on, and 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 all the problems will dissipate. But I don't think it works like <laughs> that. And why should it work? Uh, you like can that? wait a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you can wait a long time, but but um, the principles are are, are um, following the track, and and maybe. You know, the art of tracking is a very important component in, in uh, Bushman survival and, and um, understanding the information around nature is being, being available yeah. to the information highway around us. And perhaps um, the goal that we're trying to achieve, the, the, the animal that we are trying to find, the job that we are trying to create, um, maybe it's not where we think it is. Mm -hmm. Perhaps... 
the only thing we can do is is search for the next track the next first track or the first next yeah. track uh, and go from there because the, um, the the principle of tracking is that what you are looking for might be behind you how does it look like for us as humanity because i think we're on a track right now we're we're in the great unknown yeah we know yeah. we're well, but basically we know we're in shit uh, yeah but we don't know where to go yeah well that's uh, i'm not so sure i, I can answer that mm. um but what i could suggest what i've discovered from the the principles of tracking is that we are all trackers we are all still trackers i i may track elephant and, and lion for a living but but uh, you would track um different things you would track the progress of your your students or the you know the, yeah. the demands of your clients or perhaps infection rates you know, if you're a, if you're a fisherman you'll track the tides if you're a doctor you'll track the progress of your patients if you you'll track your your health your heart rate your blood pressure so the principles of paying attention to information around you are universal yeah. is it also the way that you can learn to experience interconnectedness into being yeah, because ecology Basically, yeah, if you would define it, yeah. it's the recognition of interrelatedness, that everything is yeah. related, that it's a web of life. Yeah. Um, but how do you see it? Because it takes more than just, you know, you can, you can watch this wonderful picture of all these wonderful birds. Uh, but this is, this is not ecology, this is biology. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to look yeah. beyond yeah. the species. Yeah, so how d how did how did you how do you learn that? Because I think this is one of the key elements of yeah. our indigenous brothers and sisters. Eh? They they see yeah, I interconnectedness. Think, I, th I think um, um, the the natural person, um, if he exists at all in in the year twenty twenty two, yeah. I think spends the majority of time in the present moment. Um, and um, you know. It's probably not viable or possible for us all to to drop out of society and go and live in the Kalahari. Why would we want to? It's a very hard, challenging, thirsty existence. Um, it but will also be quite busy then. The Kalahari would not be the Kalahari. Yeah, <laughs> but the, the the point is that 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 to re to redeem ourselves, that we need to connect with the redemptive space of nature, and finding that empty moment uh, where we can separate. Uh, the situation that we are facing with our reaction to it yeah. to slow down basically um, that can if you do that often enough then then perhaps you can kind of in a sense reboot your uh, your sense of attention yeah. you know to move slower yeah, so uh, in that process you might you might discover the goal I've been searching for my whole life is actually it's behind me or, or I've changed my mind. My priorities have changed, you know? It's like a very big yeah. meditation zendo, <laughs> the bush. <laughs> so, so we have to sit on a, on a, on a meditation pillow to find <laughs> that stillness. And, uh, like yeah. that, I mean, yeah. there isn't a point no, in life. No, it's not hard to see. <laughs> yeah, it's not a Gucci chair or anything. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an old uh, canvas chair. But look at the view, I mean, look at the mirror. Yeah, it's um, incredible, and, and that, that is that is that is a timeless place, and that's where these moments can can happen. Okay, and quite often, folks who who spend time out there uh, will come back differently. I think it was Rumi who said, "You know, no, no man crosses the same river twice." Because yeah. the river may be the same; that's not relevant. But the man is different when he comes back yeah. because of the journey, and and the, the, I think we all have an understanding of what luxury is. I think there's degrees of luxury in in the experience we are trying to attain. So if you go out into nature uh, with the express understanding to to maintain this, in a sense, this lifeline like, like a scuba diver has, so you want to maintain your lifestyle out in, a, in nature by having your food cooked by a, a chef trained in Paris or you know the, the, the linen on the beds or the, the size of the camp then, it's a wonderful experience to do. It's a, it's a fantastic experience, but but the degree of luxury I believe should should be addressed. Yeah. You know, if we if we are traveling to wild places, if you if you travel with um, 
if you travel with expectation, you're going to meet confrontation. Mm -hmm. If you travel with fear, you're going to meet problems. But if you travel like a human being, you're going to meet other human beings. Yeah. And that's where using these moments uh, of connectedness in, in your work or uh, in, a, in the context of organizational leadership, you know, if you, if, you, if you can get as many people sitting around a table in the sacred space, can you imagine the sense of healing and tolerance? Yeah. Because compassionate listening, listening is the basis, is the foundation of tolerance. So if you can get people sitting there yeah. on the same level, disarmed and vulnerable. Yeah, I love the fact that you, uh, in, the, in the last couple of days, quite often you, you, you mention the human animal rather than human being or, yeah. or people. And I find it a very accurate <laughs> description that maybe that's one of the key problems that we've totally lost yeah. that realization that, you know, that we are, we are part. We are, you know, we're a, we're a species. We're not, yeah. we're not above or, or beyond. We, you know, we're, yeah. we're there. Yeah, um, that, that's it. I think the ecology is the standard operating procedure of everything that yeah. we know. Um, we are still part of it. We are dependent on the laws of ecology. I think what has happened since since we've become <coughs> advanced, you know, since modern living emerged, we've slowly, possibly one generation at a time, stepped away from that. So we've stepped outside the understanding that the laws of ecology are still relevant for us. It's not about it's a, it's it's about ecology, yeah. egoology, yeah. not ecology. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's a serious disconnection. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. So we have to. That is that. Yeah. For that, that I, I think that is this, the the most profound summary of natural leadership. It's, it's getting yeah getting back to the. Yeah. N to to nature to nature, but also our yeah. our own nature, <laughs> our human nature. So, if you uh, if you would say, yeah. Hey, last question for time technical reasons. Um, so we said, you know, we and and, and 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 you did. This is a lovely, optimistic, hopeful uh, evening. Um, so let's also end with optimism and 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 hope. So, what do you think is there? That we can do, all of us, to 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 basically spread the love. Yeah. So how do we get more people to fall in love with Mother Nature? Yeah. How do we do it? Spending time in it, which which does I know what the question is going to be. How do you spend time with nature in the middle of Amsterdam or New York or any big city? How do you actually do it? Because that that is the that's the motherland. That's the ground zero. That that's the turbocharged experience. And and do I have to go there and and, and fly halfway across the world and and um, to to have these moments, or, or are they available elsewhere? And I I believe they they are. Yeah. They may come in different forms. So we need to get uh, out there. Yeah, I mean, consider that the next time a bird lands on your washing line, uh, or your windowsill, or. Um, if you have an opportunity to go and walk on the beach, take your shoes off. Yeah. Um, have some coffee with with your loved one every morning and just say nothing. Say 50% less yeah. than you would normally do. Have a day of saying 50% less than you normally do and you'll be amazed at the power of what you don't say. You'll refine what you say and you'll be empowered by what you don't say. You become a better listener. And for me, that that... It's it's not uh, yeah wilderness is not a place it, it is a place but it's not you know it, it's inside of us you you can access it at any time yeah but the desensitization is 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 a problem and um, case I think um, just to I know we running into the referee's yeah, giving us he's yeah, looking yeah, at his watch uh, yeah yeah <laughs> but for for me you know if you I think it's that simple yeah and there's no doubt that it's it's naive, and then people will have a ton of questions saying, "Yeah, does, how does this work?" And you know, if you do, how, how does it really work? But it's so simple that um, the confrontations or the the, um, the the differences in philosophies or religions or, or belief systems 
um, are so mixed and jumbled. I believe in, in, an, in an effort to understand how can it be so simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, simplicity is hard. <laughs> how can it be so simple? Yeah. How is it possible? Yeah. Uh, you know, and as soon as you think about it, uh, as soon as you become mindful about it, it becomes a challenge. But if you stay mindless, the beginner's mind <laughs> about it, maybe, maybe, um, maybe you'll make yourself more available to it. Thank you very much for your wisdom. I've absolutely enjoyed the uh, the last week we spent together. <laughs> I've learned a lot from you. And I'm sure that everybody here tonight also learned a lot from your wonderful stories. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I have to uh, say yes, bye to the you. viewers at home. <laughs> thank you, guys. If, thank you for uh, for being part of this uh, talk. So we're going to continue here uh, live and direct with the uh, audience. But uh, this is it for the live cast and the uh, video recordings. Bye-bye.